Good, well, good afternoon, good evening, good day to everyone who's out there watching as a spectator. And I'd like to sincerely thank my panel who have joined us from many different continents all over the world. So good evening. It's very late in the evening for one of you, very early in the morning for another. And I believe uh, for the rest of us, we're on a similar time zone. So uh, I just want to start the session, um, which is titled Marketing Tourism as a destination for employment. And to dig under that a bit deeper, this is about job retention and job creation in the travel and tourism industry. And I want to put a specific twist on this. Well, there are two. This is an investment conference. So I'd like us to think about that from a, um, an investment perspective. I'm gonna start with a couple of uh, facts, which I'm sure many of us have heard of already. I haven't heard them quoted today so far. A report from the WTTC on the 29th of October stated 174 million travel and tourism jobs could be lost in 2020 if barriers to global travel remain in place. Tens of millions of jobs have already been lost, possibly forever. There was a survey published just late last week by uh, an organization called Travel Gossip and the Advantage Travel Group in the UK, where it said 67% of travel agents will run out of cash by the end of this year. And only 12% of agents and operators will have enough cash reserves to still be in business by 2021, 12%. That's an enormous deficit. With these challenges faced globally, we're going to ask questions of our panel of experts, but as I said before, being mindful of this conference is about investment and the possibilities and the positive outlooks that could arise from it. Um, I've been asked to keep the panel's uh, introductions as brief as possible today. So please uh, check on the ITIC website or my other panelists' um, profiles on, on other platforms. Uh, I'd like to introduce Brian. Brian's a destination develop and development and marketing specialist, passionate about community-led conservation and regenerative, regenerative tourism. Judy Kefagona. Judy's a, a founder of Sustainable Travel and Tourism Agenda, a Pan-African Pan organization shaping a sustainable future for Africa's tourism. Uh, Dr. Catherine Koo, I've got that right, Catherine, doctor? Yes. <laughs> Dr. Catherine Koo. Um, is an international expert on women and children in tourism. Catherine holds a number of senior tourism posts and positions and is an educator at universities in uh, a university in Australia. Um, and unfortunately, Conrad's not with us, but if he joins us later on, uh, we'll, we'll introduce him then. Okay, what we decided to do was look at a couple of specific questions. Um, and I'm gonna ask the panel to share their thoughts and ideas and have a conversation around these questions. So we'll start with, um, with question one. With a significant amount of global tourism talent already unemployed, are there any suggestions as to how we could harness and utilize this experience and expertise as we navigate through COVID? Can I ask that to Brian first, please? Yeah, I mean, it's a really big question, particularly, Nigel, when we look at the numbers that you quoted to us earlier. And I think what we're seeing is that a number of people are using this time to gain professional development experiences. Um, others are pivoting and in, in moving into different career paths or diversifying their different uh, income streams with a number of different job opportunities. You know, I'm in a unique position myself, and maybe I'm a good example where um, I led the Guyana Tourism Authority for a couple years and was asked to work myself out of a job by building the capacity of my team to lead the organization into the future. And in April, um, at the end of the month, concluded my job. Uh, I was then recruited by a couple of nonprofit boards to um, support their governance, um, recently by a development bank to provide a, a tourism technical advisory role to a government in um, East Africa and um, have been mentoring others and um, teaching a group of kids entrepreneurship. So I think um, 
it's not one job, but doing a lot of different things to um, to not only pay the bills, but also to um, continue to grow personally and professionally and, and meet those personal and professional goals. Um, I've had a number of people contact me too for a startup I'm working on that are looking for internship opportunities. And these are people that have recently lost jobs, but um, playing to my example of looking for professional development opportunities, there is a lot of talent out there that um, um, should be uh, utilized to its best possible ends. Yeah, I, I guess it, it's, it's how, how we do that, isn't it? Um, Catherine, from an academic perspective, I, I, know, I know you've been an entrepreneur and uh, have started and, and sold businesses, um, a, a multi-talented lady. Um, from an academic perspective, um, what is it that um, academia uh, or the ongoing uh, education systems can do to either upskill, uh, reskill um, the, the, the current huge pool of talent, as, as Brian mentioned, that's currently sitting out there waiting for uh, COVID to, to dissipate so they can get back to work? Well, like, for example, Griffith, for example, we have, uh, we have collaborated with, for example, the local councils and the local tourism industry councils to provide training. Sometimes these trainings are offered free to the industry players. So there are a lot of free courses now. We can see uh, post when COVID has happened, there are a lot of free courses, there are a lot of subsidized trainings, uh, discounted training, and even one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions. Uh, so Brian has talked about him doing all of these different things now. Uh, and surely there are lots of these things happening. But yeah, investors should definitely invest in human capital and training and coaching. And pay attention especially to women because, and I'm going to show you a very quick, uh, some very quick stats, um, if, we, if it works. <laughs> yeah, so uh, if we see here, there, there are 55, 54% of women who are, 54% uh, of people employed in tourism are women, right? So if we're looking at this workforce, then we're looking at, 54% of the workforce potentially that have become uh, redundant. So there is so much potential in this workforce and, and, and more than half of them are women. But then, so then the investors now should, uh, then we should look at how we could harness this workforce. So to do that, we need to understand what are the barriers for women uh, showing off their skills or uh, potentially practicing these skills. So some of these, so we know then also that women spend, even before COVID, women spend 4.1 hours per day doing unpaid work while men spend 1.7. This is talking about, you know, people in the same household that have doing full-time job, but women do 4.1 hours uh, or, you know, three hours more, twice more, more than twice more than men. So then what, what do we do about situations like this? When we offer free courses and training, we have to be really aware that women have the time now, since in COVID, this 4.1 hours would be much more, um, then do we, do, have we invested in, say, for example, resources for women to undertake these upskilling opportunities? Because otherwise it would be, uh, it would be redundant, right? So are we, are we investing in, for example, paid parental leave, access to childcare during these COVID times? Are we giving them flexible working hours in order for them to, be, to upskill uh, and prepare for when the market opens up? But even, even before now, if, even in COVID times, there are so many opportunities. I belong to so many women networks and can see a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunities happening in the training space. Great, Catherine, thank you. Judy, um, I, I'm very aware that you are a, a great traveler around your continent um, and you see the benefits um, that, that the tourism can bring, particularly to rural communities. Um, but what are you seeing on the ground when, when you visit different parts of uh, Kenya and other parts of Africa? Uh, are, you, are you seeing the the the, uh, the issue on the ground in real time of people that had fairly good jobs in travel and tourism um, and that are now not working, or, or, or what are they doing now? Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, there are different scenarios in different places. 
um, in the cities where, um, and I'm going to give the example of women um, who provide different services for tourism, like selling curios and uh, uh, craft for tourists visiting the cities. Mainly this happens in uh, shopping malls and shopping malls in around Nairobi, for example, have special days where they have um, mainly women come out with different types of um, uh, craft and art and, and traditional clothing and sell it there because uh, these places were frequented by tourists of different kinds mainly those who come for um, mice, who have time to, to uh, go around and some of these malls are located close to those uh, mice areas. We have uh, in Nairobi, for example, there is a special market that happens on Saturdays. It's a parking lot of the high court, but it is provided for a market for small enterprises on Saturday so that they could go here and it is, uh, it is frequented by tourists, equally by Kenyans, but mainly by tourists. Now, because these uh, um, businesses have other things to do, they, for example, if I am that small trader in Nairobi, I know on Monday I am on this mall, on Tuesday I'm on that mall, on Thursday I'm on this mall, on Saturday I'm at the market at the high court. So they keep moving from one place to another. And then when there is a, a tourism events in the city, they will keep moving from one place uh, to another. So definitely they have been, uh, th this business has been affected. But what is interesting about this particular group is that uh, they also have very high flexibility. Some of them are quickly able to shift and start uh, uh, selling different things. The malls, for example, have not stopped their market days. They still have their market days. So you will still find them there. Maybe the sales are not as high, but they're still able to go to these places um, and sell for the domestic market. Because even the domestic market knows that they're in these places in these particular times. In the rural areas, those doing this kind of trade are a little bit different and they have been affected adversely because they don't, they don't have this um, uh, uh, cycle that those in the city, small, and I'm talking about small enterprises, uh, those who get the employment from, from tourism in the rural areas, uh, particularly around the parks and the, and the pr other protected areas, they rely heavily on tourism. And already, even without COVID, their income was seasonal because we know uh, in, in, in Kenya and in much of Africa, we have seasonal tourism. We have this high season and low season. And there's some, the, the low season, some of them are completely off. So the people who already were uh, affected by seasonal tourism are twice affected by COVID because they have lost all the seasons. They used to rely heavily on one season and then they had a little bit of a shoulder season and then no season at all. And now they are totally, completely out of season. So, and, and, and the others would sell the small women groups in rural areas will provide um, services uh, in terms of stocking of the shops, the shops in the lodges, in the camps and lodges. Now, um, this, these places are closed. Where do they take it? So there has been a different, uh, and, and, and their, uh, their ability to adapt quickly is different from the women in the cities or the small traders in the cities who can decide that I, I am going to shift from selling this art and craft and I'm going to shift and start selling vegetables because I can still find a space to do that or I can find an opportunity um, uh, to do something uh, different. So the effect has been very different for the, for the um, small enterprises in tourism that rely heavily on, 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 on the tourism market for their employment. Yeah. Thank you, Judy. Um, what I'd like to, to add just to round off that question is, is a couple of, I guess, practical examples that I've been um, shown. Um, one of them was from a, a very good friend of mine in Zambia. Um, when tourism stopped, um, they became a fish wholesaler. Um, now, they're having a good time as a fish wholesaler because people still need to eat. 
and my concern and their concern, because they were a business owner and they employed five people, is if they make more money or see a job as more reliable that's now not in travel and tourism, they may not go back. So we potentially stand to lose a great deal of experience and expertise in this industry. And I have a number of friends who are similar to me in that we're all over 50. I know I don't look it, but we, we are, uh, who are concerned about not being able to be re-employed again because employers are looking for younger, fresher talent that, that may come through. So what one entity in the UK did was um, a couple of entrepreneurs got together and they have started to collate a database of anyone in the travel and tourism business, specifically in field sales or account management from any, any sector. So any, whether it be aviation, cruise, um, tour operating, whatever it happens to be. And as travel and tourism starts to come back, albeit slowly, they, are, they will be finding those people work for the travel and tourism products that need the demand, but don't need to pay full-time staff until things get back to some form of normality, if, if that indeed is the case. So a couple of very different but, but uh, real, real examples. I, I want to move on to, um, because this is actually an investment conference, and I've been watching many um, of the, the previous panel sessions, um, and, and I want you, given all of your experiences, you, you've all worked in different parts of the world, either own businesses, run businesses, work in academia, uh, work for not-for-profit or, 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 or entities, this is your opportunity to tell investors what the long-term benefits are for them in creating employment in the tourism sector, especially in developing destinations. Can, Brian, can, I, can I bring you in first, please, Brian? Uh, sure. Yeah, thank you, Nigel. Um, I think we would all agree that we're moving or have moved out of an era of volume-based tourism to one that is increasingly going to be focused on visitor quality and, and value. That is the value that each visitor represents. And we know from the previous panel and from myriad sources that more and more travelers are looking for that travel insurance assurance. They want to know that they can go to a destination and, and be able to return without any problems and have safety and hygiene protocol at the highest standards in place, et cetera. They're also, no matter what data you look at, increasingly looking for those destinations that are clean, green, and, and pristine. That is, those destinations that have adopted sustainable practices. So I think the main long-term benefit is just a move away from a strict focus on return on investment, that is, um, shareholder value to one that, at minimum, drives stakeholder value and, at the maximum, drives systems-wide value. I think the term that resonates with, with me is RO triple double I, which <laughs> basically means return on investment with integrity as investors look to build deep, meaningful, mutually beneficial relationships with host communities. Because I think uh, host communities will increasingly become the heart of tourism where those businesses that partner with those communities can offer vibrant, immersive meaningful experiences along with high quality services. So I think historically we've looked at tourism as what's available inside the fence or inside the building versus what can be offered externally. So I think the move will basically move towards not only generating a profit, but in the process, improving the well-being of residents the community as a whole that people are working within and the environments that they rely upon looking at more as a, a living system. Sure. Uh, Catherine? Yeah, I do agree. I, I do agree with Brian. I was going to say the same thing. Um, that, But in, I just want to also focus on your question on developing countries. I think in developing countries, there is a danger um, in short-term goals investing goals because uh, in those countries the priority is also is more to create employment uh, but this is this is a short-term look and I think there is a difference between creating employment and creating a skilled workforce and it's the latter that will give that long-term benefit because an investment in education pays the best interest and so we have 
to get investors to look at socially responsible investment into, uh, into like Brian says, the community, the social capital and the human capital, because we have seen in research that these kind of investments that look at the long term uh, benefits always have in, uh, increased the average growth for investors. Thank you, Catherine. And I'll leave the last word on that to Judy, please. Yeah, um, I want to agree with uh, Brian and, and, and Catherine that um, if we're focusing on uh, investing in, in developing countries, um, we know that tourism for countries that are dependent on tourism as an economic driver, which many developing countries are, then the type of tourism must be very important. And what Catherine has said is very, very significant. We cannot do what I always call um, heat and run tourism. Heat and run tourism will not transform developing nations. It must be for the long term. And it's just not about creating employment. It's about creating shared values. There has to be, it has to go um, uh, beyond the room, like Brian has said. We must create shared values with the communities where we do tourism. And that goes beyond creating employment. This is about building the entire human capacity, the, the employee capacity. It's about uh, not just employing them to be able to work for your facility. It's, uh, it's, it's employing them and skilling them to be able to develop themselves and develop the communities as they work within the tourism industry. So. If, if, if we're looking at um, investments at, at this particular time, let it not be, invest, be investments that are taking advantage of the times and saying this is the time where we can go in and get everything and invest at the lowest because every destination is desperate, especially the developing countries. Um, uh, some, of the, some of the developments that are well on pipelines for, for hotel chains some of them have been put on hold, some of them are picking up and they're going up slowly. We have seen um, big hotels close down. We, we saw in, in, in Nairobi, in Kenya, we saw, we, we saw big groups, big hotels that are now closed down and are on sale. And, and uh, when we're looking for new investment in these places, it can't be for the short term because it will not help these destinations if it is for the short term. And if it is not for shared values, if the investment has got to benefit the, the concrete walls in which this uh, enterprise exists, that is not the kind of investment that is needed for the developing countries at the moment. And we are all talking um, um, sustainable uh, development. So even the investments must be sustainable. They must be for the long term. And this starts, this starts not with the investors, unfortunately. This starts with the destination policies. Countries Great. and developing countries must be very intentional about the kind of development that they want. And when they're so intentional about that, it will show very clearly in their policies. And this will guide every investor. So it's not a free uh, playing field for investors like it has been in the past where tourism has reached and with the kind of uh, discussions that uh, Brian has just said, we've got travelers who are looking for value. And so we are looking for return on investment with integrity. I love that, with, with integrity. So destinations must begin to be very intentional about tourism investment. They cannot leave it as an open field and say, you come in, provided you bring in tourism development, provided you come in as an investor, we will receive you with open arms and we will take every time that you have given us. It has to be a very, very fair playing ground. Judy, thank you so much. I think you've reached consensus. Um, I wish we could talk about this for another, 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 another while, but um, I've been asked to wrap up. So what I'll, I'll end on is I, I, I certainly have heard um, all the very positive and, and constructive comments and thank, thank my panelists for that a great deal of expertise on, on display this evening. I guess if, if I leave um, people with, with one thought, it's that governments all over the world have undervalued the benefit of travel and tourism to their respective nations for far too long. Now they don't have it, they see the value that tourism can bring as a GDP contributor. But it should be seen as a contributor to the health 
and wealth of the nation, of the peoples of those nations, wh wherever they happen to be. I think to create the best possible return on investment, you have to, you have to give a proportion of any investment over to education and the ongoing upskilling and training of the people who you are expecting to deliver those authentic, genuine products and services that you will rely on that customers you're looking to attract will be prepared to pay for. So people, community, and integrity. I, I like, um, that's gonna be my buzzword of, 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 of the evening. So um, mm -hmm. ladies and uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. And uh, uh, I look forward to talking with you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Nigel.